in my first session, I explained to you who the elemental spirits are, what they do. In my second session, I explained how baptism is a breaking off or cutting off from those elemental spirits. And in the third session, I, I am, um, and in the, and in the third session, I'm going, I'm going to explain to you how it is that you actually baptize a nation. So, so are we ready? The session's called Yahweh is a Man of War, and we're going to post all of these um, presentations on um, our Faith Fellowship Facebook page, so you can get all of this stuff. Okay, are we ready? Amen. Okay, so um, we go, let's go back to um, Deuteronomy 32, verse 8 to 9. Actually, verse 8. When the Most High assigned lands to the nations, he divided up the human race, he established boundaries of the people according to the number in his heavenly court. So what we see there is that the heavenly court, these elemental spirits, um, they are actually assigned specific areas of land, and people live in those areas of land. And God handed them over to them. In, in a sense, he gave them a legal right to control those peoples. And so, and, and, and the reason why I did this is explained in Deuteronomy 4 verse 19. It said, when you look up into the sky and see the sun, moon, and stars, and this is the key phrase, all the forces of heaven. Don't be seduced into worshiping them. The, the Lord your God gave them to all the peoples of the earth. So the, the forces of heaven... Which, which to a certain extent represent, are represented by the heavenly bodies, the stars, the sun, and the moon. There's, there's supernatural beings that are represented by them. And people stopped worshiping God. They started to worship these heavenly beings. So let me give you, let me give you a really good example. What is the second biggest religion in the world? Islam. What, what do you see on every nation that serves Islam? The moon. The moon may be a star, but it's, not, it's the moon. Allah is, a, is the moon god. Allah is the moon god. They're actually worshipping the moon or the, or the supernatural or elemental spirit behind that, that, that um, is represented by the moon. So they worship the moon god. So I'm not saying there's a man on the moon or a god on the moon. What I'm saying is, is that they stopped worshiping God. They started worshiping the moon. And of course, as soon as you worship the moon, there's a spirit that, you, that then becomes ruler. And so what we see is, the countries that worship Allah put the symbol of their elemental spirit on their flag. They actually do that. So what elemental spirit does Pakistan worship? What force of heaven? The moon god. Yeah. So, and, and so, when we, so, so, um, so let's get to Egypt. Now, now they worship the moon god, mostly. No, now. They, Islam. So now they mostly worship the moon god. But at the time, they had various supernatural forces that they worshipped. So Exodus 12, verse 11 to 12 says, These are your instructions for eating this meal. Be fully dressed, wear your sandals, eat the meal with urgency, for this is the Lord's Passover. On that night, I will pass through the land of Egypt and strike down every firstborn and every firstborn male animal in the land of Egypt. And here's the key line. 
I will execute judgment against all the gods of Egypt, for I am the Lord. So what we have is the people of Egypt had been handed over to supernatural forces. They'd been handed over to these elemental spirits by God. And the land of Egypt, the territory of Egypt, the region of Egypt was controlled by these elemental spirits. And they, were, they controlled Pharaoh, as I taught you yesterday. And so it was really these gods that were these demon spirits, these elemental spirits that were holding Israel in slavery. They were holding God's people in slavery. So when we get to the, when we get to the, the ten plagues, each of these plagues was a judgment against the God. So the plague of frogs was happy, the, the God of the Nile. Um, then we've, oh sorry, it was happy, the God of the Nile. Then Heket, the frog god, the plague of frogs. So first it was the Nile that was it. Then Geb, the, du the, the, the dust of the earth. Um, that, was, that was lice. Then um, the plague of flies, because they had a Kepri, an Egyptian god of creation. And so God inflicted their God of creation onto them. Then there was Hathor, God of love and protection. And um, that was when the pestilence fell on the livestock, because of course it, the, the Hathor looked like a cow, so God killed all the cows. Then there was um, with Isis, and this was the God of medicine and peace. They, what God actually did was... Um, what God actually did was he inflicted them with boils. Now, this is very interesting. The, the, Egyptian, the way the Egyptians worshipped God was they put a lot of emphasis on, on cleanliness. So, I don't know if you've seen movies or whatever in, from that time. A lot of them had shaven heads. So... So what happened is, is with the, the god of the flies, then the, the lice, and then the boils, meant that God completely, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, God completely paralyzed their worship of their gods. Because if they were unclean, they couldn't go into the temple to worship their gods. So this wasn't just arbitrary plagues. This is God literally um, paralyzing the, the, the worship of demons in that particular area so that he could execute his purpose. So this is totally, utterly, and completely strategic. God is literally trying to paralyze the worship of demons and as we, uh, now you, you, it'll become more clearer why, by the Egyptian people, and basically what, he's trying to, what he, God was doing is, is he was depowering the demon spirits in that area. So the demon spirits are holding the Israelites captive. What does God do? He sends three plagues which stops their worship, which then depowers them in, that, in Egypt. Remember, I said to you, God plays chess with, with, um, with, with these elemental spirits, and he does, because there's, there's strike and counter-strike all the time. So, for instance, let me ask you this. Who killed Jesus? Hmm? No, someone killed him. Or, or he was killed by, by something. What's that famous scripture? The principalities and powers would not have killed Jesus if they hadn't known. Hmm. You know that's famous scripture. So, 
So God, so they, the principalities and powers killed Jesus, except that, of course, Jesus was crucified before the foundations of the earth. And through Jesus' death, their powers were broken. So literally what God did is he lured these elemental spirits in to kill Jesus, and they thought they were winning a victory, and meantime it was their defeat. So literally God ambushes these principalities and powers. It's why, one of the reasons why I call this conference Yahweh is a man of war is because, is because there's a war in the heavenlies, and because we tend to think of God as sort of like Superman. He blows this and does that. But, but there, there, there's much more of a war in the supernatural than we actually realize. If, 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 if God didn't have real opposition, why then did he have to lure the principalities and powers into killing Jesus? Why did Jesus even have to die? He's literally, there's a war in the supernatural between God and these elemental spirits. And so, so in this case, what, it, it's like, it's, it, let's, let's take a good example. When the Americans invade a country, and they've invaded a few lately, what do they do? First thing they do, they take out the air support. That's why they can invade a country so quickly. Um, the, the Russians invaded Ukraine and didn't seem to care about their support. That's why a year and a half later they're still fighting. What God did was is so strategic. He sends his plagues to take out the air support so that he can set his people free. So let's keep going. Then there's not... The, the, the Egyptian god of the sky, and there God sent hailstones. So he was, dis, he was also discrediting these gods that were holding his people captive. And then, and then there was um, locusts, and that was Seth, and he was the god of storm and disorder. God was discrediting Seth. And then we get to, to the, 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 the darkness, God was discrediting the sun god, Ra. So he's, dis, he's paralyzing, disabling the, the, these gods and discrediting them in the eyes of the Egyptian people. Why? So that their hold over Egypt could be loosened so that his people could go. So the last one was, of course, Pharaoh. The son, and he was deemed the son of, of Ra. So, if all the firstborn in the, nation, in the nations were, if all the, if all the firstborn in the nations were um, eliminated, then the coming Pharaoh was also killed. In fact, there, there, there is historical record in, I think, 1500 BC of a Pharaoh son that just disappeared. And it seems, because there's two timelines, 1500 B.C. and 1300 B.C. 1500 B.C., uh, there's some debate about which it is, but I, I tend to f favor an early date because of the history. And a, a, a Pharaoh's eldest son just disappeared. God was taking down Pharaoh, who was worshipped as a god, as the tenth plague. So... So what has is, what is this all got to do with anything? Well, when God handed over these countries or these regions to these gods, effectively he gave them a legal right to control them. So let's, let's read Colossians 2 verse 14. It says, He canceled the record of charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. I... It's probably better translated as having blotted out the handwriting in the ordinance that is against us, that was contrary to us. 
what it's really saying, and I understand why the translators battle to translate this phrase, because they, they probably didn't fully understand the whole thing of the elemental spirits, is that he canceled the legal right that these principalities and powers, these elemental spirits had over, the, over lands, over regions. He canceled them. And what did he do? In this way, he disarmed them, removed their legal right, their hold over these people, and the spiritual rulers and authorities, and he shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. So what, so what Jesus did on the cross is remove the legal right that the, people, that the spirit over Asia had to, to control those people. So when Paul pitches up there, the legal right of those supernatural power, that the supernatural power, the elemental spirits over Asia, which is now Turkey, is broken, which is why Paul can then come in and two million people can hear the gospel. So... The cross breaks that legal right once and for all. So the best way to explain it is, is you have, you've been given, a, you've, you've, you rent a, a building. So they give you the rent for a particular building. At the end of the, of the agreement, you lose your legal right. But the problem with these elemental spirits is what happened is they stayed on after the lease had ended. So they lost their legal right. But let's be honest, in Saudi Arabia, the elemental spirit, the moon god, the force of the air, is still squatting there. He's still, he's still in charge. Um, open Doors says there's not common... There's, there, there's maybe two, 3,000 Christians in the whole of Saudi Arabia. What's happened there is the moon god, the force of heaven, the elemental spirit over, the, over Saudi Arabia, he's lost his legal right over that territory, but he continues to occupy it. Now, why can he continue to occupy it? So let's take a, a, a let's jump to a story about Jesus. So he, Jesus heads out from Galilee, and he goes to the country of the Ga Ga Gerizines, which is opposite Galilee. Now, if it's opposite Galilee, then it's on the other side of the Jordan. To, it's the Transjordan. Um, and if you remember that there, it was Gad and two, two other it was two other tribes, Gad and the half-tribe, that, that wanted to stay there. And God actually didn't want them to be there because he said, I want you to be on this side of the Jordan. Because, and, and it was very, very clear. And eventually they beg Moses and say, we want to be on that side of the Jordan. And so what happens is, is slowly but surely those tribes disappear they get integrated. So they're still sort of Jewish now, 2,000 years later, but sort of not. Because what good Jew keeps 3,000 pigs? So they're really doing their own thing. And they've, they, they're on the wrong side of the Jordan. And, and, and the reason why is because the, 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 the trans, the, this side of the Jordan the western side of the Jordan had been reserved for God's people. And I believe that for very specific reasons, that particular area hadn't, had, had been cordoned off from these elemental spirits. So they kept themselves under the power of the elemental spirits. And the elemental spirits took over and destroyed them. They were eating pigs. Anyway, so Jesus goes there. And Mark 5, verse 6 to 10 says, And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down. This is the guy with all the demons. Crying out with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus? What have you to do with me? What is it that you want? So he immediately the demon, he knew and the demons knew that 
that, that there was something happening here. And I believe it was because when, when the Jesus arrived, there was no hold. He couldn't, they couldn't find a hold. So he carries on. Um, he, he, he casts out the demons. But here's the important thing. And it says, and he, and he begged them earnestly not to send them out of the country. So these demons know they have to leave. But they say, please don't send us out of the country. So what we see is, or region, so we see that these elemental spirits, these demon spirits, fall under elemental spirits, are region-based. That's why you go to the UK, as Richard recently went, and they've got different problems to what we have. Because each of these elemental spirits are bullying the people under them in their unique way. So we, from the scripture, it's very clear that these demons fell under that specific throne and they wanted to stay there. And they said, Jesus, please don't send us out here. Now, I, that seems pretty obvious to me. But why, why, would, why would Jesus not send them out of the region? Why was Jesus kind to these demons? Well, let's, let's read. So the, 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 the pigs all run over the edge of the cliff and they land in the sea. And of course, Jesus has to leave. One of my favorite things to imagine is the Jesus and the disciples rowing past 3,000 pigs floating in the so push that one away, row, but push that one away. It's crazy, actually, if you start to imagine it, you know, sea of pigs, you know. What must, what must the, the whole area of thought afterwards, you know, Sea of Galilee, our source of water, poisoned by 3,000 pigs? Anyway, so, so I want to jump to right to the end. So... So, oh, so the herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and the people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion sitting there, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to, to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And this is why Jesus didn't send the demons out of the region. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from the region. So they wanted those demons. They didn't want Jesus. So although the legal right that those demons had to stay in that region was broken, Jesus allowed them because the people to stay, because the people in that area wanted them. They wanted them. So we have the city and country that we have chosen. Because the, there's no more legal right. We can, to, uh, the, the elemental spirits no longer have a legal right over us and the rest of our people. That, that was broken at the cross. But James will testify that you can have any demon you want to. <laughs> They're very helpful that way. You want a demon? He'll come. And so we look at our city and we look at the problems and the effects of the demons. And guess what? We have the demons we wanted, we chose. In Kenya, in Zimbabwe, in South Africa, we've chosen the country that we're in. We've chosen the demons. And we've, they've, they've hung about. And, and so let, let me ask you this. So you are, so, so you, you own a house and the tenants, the lease ends and they stay on, what happens? If nothing happens, never take legal action. 
You've got squatters on your hands. And so we choose to take the, keep these demons. So, so let's go to Luke 8, 27 to 28. When Jesus had stepped out on land, there he met a man from the city who had demons for a long time. He had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a city but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I beg you, do not torment me. So instantly they meet Jesus, and they like, there's a war here, and, we, and we're going to lose this war. They instantly knew. They instantly knew that Jesus was more powerful and that Jesus could torment them. So what principle do we, we find here? And I want to take us to John 14, verse 30 to 31. I will no longer talk much with you, for the ruler of the world is coming. He has no claim on me, Jesus says. So the reason why they knew they had lost is because they had no claim on Jesus. They had no foothold. They had no they couldn't hold on to him in any sort of way. They had no legal, they had no legal right because, because there was nothing that Jesus had given them space to grab onto. So I want to give you a good example of what I'm talking about. Ephesians 4, 27, and it says, Don't sin by letting anger control you. So if you let anger control you, what happens? Don't let the sun go down while you're still angry, for anger gives a foothold to the devil. So Jesus, when he's saying he has nothing on me, there is no foothold for the demon in Jesus. So what happens is, even though we may not necessarily know we're choosing it, if we're giving Satan footholds, He's going to stay. So we look at our nation and we, and we see very clearly the elemental spirits trying to destroy our nation and, and chase its people away and oppress the poor. And the reason that these elemental spirits can do that is because we give them a foothold. We, 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 we literally, it's like, like a bus. We open the door. And the demon can jump on, eventually brings all his friends and sits, fills the whole bus. The reason why we still have elemental spirits, the reason why we are still, they, 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 they're still destroying our country is because we give them footholds. Jesus didn't. And so they're in our land because we've given them that space. And they will take whatever space you give them. So what does Jesus do? So I've, Last year I spoke about his evangelism strategy, how he first went around to churches. Then he, then he established himself in Capernaum in a house and he started preaching in Capernaum. And then he, sends, uh, then he sends out people, but I want to show you what instruction he sent these people out with. He says, whenever you enter someone's home, first say, may God's peace be on this house. If those who live there are peaceful, the blessing will stand. If they're not, the blessing will return to you. Don't move around from home to home, stay in one place, eating and drinking what they provide. Don't hesitate to accept hospitality because you deserve their pay. So what was their goal was to find homes where the peace of God could lodge. So they go, Jesus goes over to the Gadarenes, the descendants of Gad. Jesus wants to bring the peace of God there, and they're like, get out of here. So they keep their demons. But when, you, when, you, when, when the disciples or the apostles went out to these homes, and they, they said, the peace of God, and they were like, absolutely. Then the devil was pushed out of that home. Where, that, where they didn't want Jesus, they didn't want the message of the kingdom, then Jesus was pushed out of that home. So it, it, it's about 
what you want in your home. So a lot of people want anger. They want to hold on to their anger about what stuff's happened to them or the, our history or whatever. Guess what? You're giving a foothold to the devil. The Prince of Peace cannot find a foothold in your life. The demons have a foothold in your life. And so we have a country with house after house after house where demons are in charge because people gave them a foothold. So, um, I want to show you this. If a town refuses to welcome you, go out into its streets and say, we wipe even the dust of your town from your, our feet to show that we have abandoned you to your fate. Why did they wipe the, the, the dust of their feet off? The reason is, is because that town had chosen to be ruled by the spirits. They had continued to remain under the thrall and control of the demon spirits. And the apostles were not to take any, even the, a speck of dust from that area. Because they were to give no foothold to the devil whatsoever. That's why they had to wipe the dust off their feet. Of course, the, the, the corollary of that is they had chosen, that town had chosen to be ruled by the elemental spirits. And when they had an opportunity to break that hold, and so it was going to be worse for them than Sodom and Gomorrah. That's the, the product of that choice. But the, the, the apostles weren't specifically doing it to condemn them. They were announcing that they were going to have, and they were announcing that there could not even be a speck of dust that, it be, that was under co the control of the elemental spirits on them. Because they could not, you cannot give a place to the devil, even the speck of dust. So let's, so, um, let's quickly go over what Jesus does. So he calls his 12 disciples and he sends them out. And they go out. Now, one of the, the misconceptions I'd always had is that Jesus would preach and they, the disciples would sit there. And he did do a bit of that. But mostly, he sent his disciples out. And he first sent out 12. And then he sent out, it, it says 70. God chose 70. Now, some translations say 72 and some say 70. The reason why... The, the, for the, the reason for the discrepancy is if you count the nations in Genesis 12, in the Masoretic text, you come to 70. If you count the nations in Genesis 12 in the Septuagint, the Greek translation, which is of the, the, the Old Testament, which is actually what the early church read, you come to 72. So the number isn't so important, how many nations. The point is, is that Jesus sent out a disciple to take for every nation in Genesis 12. So Jesus sent out a comprehensive evangelism team, but his focus was Galilee. And so these guys went into Galilee, and in town after town, they brought the peace of God and drove out the demons. In town after town. Peace of God, does the, is the peace of God resting here? Yes, demons go. And more and more um, houses in more and more towns in the whole of Galilee had pushed out the control of the demons, the elemental spirits, and brought in the control of Jesus till it reached a critical mass. And we see this once in a while. Let's read Mark 30 to 34. The apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour and told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest for a while. So we see there it's not Jesus going off preaching. He's receiving them back from the apostles preaching. What are they doing? Establishing the peace of God all around Galilee. Then Jesus said, let's go, but it's, but People are coming to them. So now remember at the beginning of this evangelism strategy, 
they were chasing the people. They were going out to the town. Let's see what happens when enough people open their house to the peace of God. And he said this because so many people were coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. Because they're trying to have a staff meeting and people are just disturbing them. Just all they want is the disciples. All they want is Jesus. Why? And he said, so Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left by boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. But when Jesus, the people recognized them and saw them leaving... And the people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. Jesus saw the huge crowd as he stepped from the boat and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. That goes back to Matthew 9. So he began to teach them many things. So, so what happens is, is there's a change of spiritual atmosphere there's a pushing out of these demon spirits that have been ruling Galilee more and more and more. And so where they had been going out to try and win people for Jesus, bring the peace of God, now suddenly they can't even have a staff meeting together. In fact, it's so bad that they go on a staff retreat. And as they... As, as they're rowing, they're watching the crowd grow along the edge of the lake. <laughs> okay, it's a 1,000 now. Uh, eventually, Jesus feeds the 5,000 which, which, uh, men, which translates to roughly 15,000 people. So he's go, they're rowing. Okay, it's gone up to a 1,000. Oh, it's 2,000 now. And they're running along the lake. And as they're, as they're going past, the, the, more people are coming out of the village, <laughs> you know? So they go in with a, thousand, with a thousand people into the village. They come out with one and a half thousand on the other side. And so it goes on. And they're rowing. We're trying to get away from these people. And it's just growing and growing and growing. They get to the other side, their destination, and there's 15,000 people sitting there saying, preach to us. They'd gone from having to chase people to where they were being pursued by an ever-growing crowd. The spiritual dynamic, and we'd say, oh, it was Jesus. It was the disciples that had really done this. Yes, Jesus was the mastermind, and, but it wasn't Jesus preaching in all of these places. It was the disciples bringing the peace of God into those villages, into those houses. And so this is why it happened. Luke, when the, when the 72 came back, or the 70, depending on which translation you read, Luke 10, 18 to 20, he says, Yes, he told them, I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I've given you authority over all the power of the enemy. So what happens is, is that this elemental spirit in Galilee fell to the ground, fell from his throne, was removed by his throne because he no longer was being given a place in Galilee. And when... They no longer had a foothold or a place in Galilee. Guess what? He came down. And so, and Jesus says, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. So now you can't crush stuff in the air. The, the demons are now on the ground. Go and stand on them and crush them. Nothing will injure you. Now, a lot of people want to do this through prayer. They want to pray and they want to bind the strong man and pull him down and all of that. But then it's then they manalian or 20 people in a room. And what happens? The, the strong man comes down, he goes away, comes back seven times, and each time we do that, our city gets worse. Because we don't stand on the snakes and scorpions when the strong man comes down. So what we need to be doing is we need to, I don't know if you've watched Bakhmut, the, the war in Bakhmut um, in Ukraine. They've been, the Ukrainians and Russians have been fighting house to house in Bakhmut. 
Our job is to go and fight house after house, pushing down, pushing the enemy out of house after house after house. And at a point, there's no longer place for the principality and powers thrown to stand in that area, and he falls. And so what was, what was baptism? It was cutting off the power of the elemental spirit <coughs> in you. <coughs> and baptism was cutting off the power of that elemental spirit um, over Israel, the, the spirits of Egyptians when they went through the water. When we baptize a nation, we're removing the place for the devil. Elemental spirits no longer can stay there. <coughs> We've evicted the squatters to such an extent that they're gone. They have no place any longer. So that's quickly. I'm going to try and be quick now. So, so how did this happen in Israel? Because remember, they, and of course, they all got together in homes, and they, and they put blood and, and, and they, even, they got families together and they, they chewed on the lamb, the, the, Jesus, literally, the lamb of God. They literally chewed on the word together, the, Jesus the word. They chewed on Jesus together. They ate Jesus. They applied the blood to the, the house. Um. And they, Exodus 12 says they, they had to take some of the blood and smear it on the door frame. So they literally, so that the devourer cannot come into that house. So because of, of this happening in house after house, what could happen was that God could bring a judgment on the gods of Israel. Why? Because they, they no longer had the hold or foothold over the Israelis. So, the other thing is that they were to have, um, and, and I want to quickly show you how yeast right through the Bible represents bad stuff. So why can't you understand that I'm not talking about bread? So again I say, beware the yeast of the Pharisees and Sadducees. The F Pharisees and Sadducees were under the control of the elemental spirits. And it said, then at last they understood he wasn't speaking about the yeast in the bread, but about the deceptive teachings of the Pharisees and Sadducees. So it represents deceptive teachings. Where do deceptive teachings come from? The elemental spirits. The elemental spirits use deceptive teachings, whether it be about communism or the word of God even, that to deceive us and control us. So what did they have to do? For seven days, the bread you, you eat must be without yeast. Get rid of the yeast out of your home. And so they met together, they ate, they had no yeast in their homes. And so what happened is they could break out of the control of these elemental spirits, go through the water of baptism and their control be completely broken. They could do this because they'd been obedient to God. They'd met together, they'd pled the blood of Jesus, they put the blood of the lamb over, they'd eaten the lamb together, they'd fellowship together. So let's go back to Acts. What does Acts 2 say? It says that they met each day, um, they worshiped together in the temple, public place, each day. And met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals together with great joy and generosity, all the while praising God and in, enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So every day people were being saved. It was like now the people are chasing them. Why? Because they had been pushing out the footholds that the, the devil had right across Jerusalem out of their homes. In fact, this is the strategy that Paul used in Act, um, Acts 20.20. 20. This is 35 years later, 27 to 30 years later. Paul says, I never shrank back from telling you what you needed to hear, either publicly or in your homes. 
that co- we always emphasize the Sunday service, the public, the public meetings, but we need to be removing the footholds that the devil has in the homes, and you do that through meeting in homes, through connect groups. If you don't have these two, these two legs together, you're never going to push out these squatters, these elemental spirits that are holding our city, our, our province, our nation, and our continent captive. In fact, um, and I'm running out of time fast, but um, I want to use the example of his people. His people built one of the biggest connect group systems our country has ever seen. And they did it in, in UCT. In, in the 80s, UCT was Moscow on the hill. There was all kinds of, obviously, the, there was all kinds of bad stuff going on in UCT. It was, it was considered a godless place. And his people built a team and they started to open connect groups. And, they, and at a point, the, the, um, the pastor there actually had a vision of the, the, the crown coming off the, the spirit's head at UCT. And it got to such an extent that they weren't able to cope with the number of people coming into their churches. They didn't know where to put them. They had, they had 5,000 people in connect groups. Mark Surf ran it. And at one point, they only had two people on the SRC that weren't serving Jesus that weren't in his people. And so the elemental spirits hit back and the the pastor fell into sin. And a lot of what they had done of baptizing UCT, removing the footholds, cutting off the footholds that the devil has, the elemental spirits has, has been reversed now and UCT is busy spiraling back into a mess. But the strategy works it's happened in, it's happened in um, South Korea with Yong Yi Cho for a period. It's happening in China as they push out, so they're baptizing their nation. So what made God start to intervene in the, in, for Israel in Egypt? Because he directed the strategy to get them out. It says, look, the cry of the people of Israel has reached me. Now I've seen how harshly the Egyptians abuse them. Now go, for I'm sending to you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people Israel out of Egypt. What moves God to start to move in this way is a cry. Jesus baptized Galilee. Moses and, and God baptized. In fact, it was, it's, it's very clear that it was Jesus who led the Israelites out of Egypt. God's plan is to baptize nations. His plan is to baptize South Africa, Kenya, Zimbabwe, Tanzania. To break off completely the footholds that Satan has in our land. So what I'm here to tell you is that the Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. This is my God and I'll praise him, my Father, and I will exalt him. The Lord Yahweh is a man of war. The Lord is his name. He's here. And I feel the presence of the Lord here. He's he's here to free our nation. He's here to baptize our nation. We need to cry out to him. We need to push out the footholds that the squatters have had in our nation for so long, for thousands of years. So who is like you, O Lord, like you among the gods, O Lord, glorious in holy, holiness, awesome in splendor, performing great wonders? So how do you baptize a nation? How do you break the power of the elemental spirits, which is the essence of baptism? Is you baptize, you you push out, you you push out all these, their stupid philosophies in parliament, in council, but most of all in home after home after home after home. And at some point, 
the, the, the demon spirit who's been sitting on his throne comfortably for thousands of years falls. And do you know what happens then? You get no rest because people just begging you to come to salvation. They just want to hear your preaching. They just want to be in church. They just want to experience worship. And we've seen these dynamics at times. We've seen them in Colombia, also with the G12 system there, the connect groups. We've seen it in China. We've seen it in Wales when there's the... And this happens when the demon spirit no longer, the elemental spirit no longer has a foothold. Because right now, our people are giving, them, giving the, these elemental spirits place across our city, across our province, and across our country. And we need to evict them. Yahweh is a man of war. He's ready for the fight. He wants to fight for us. Let's partner with him.